Shalom, welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar, together with my co-host Mark Vornich of jbiztechvalley.com and Statewide News Service. What well, do you have today, Mark? Well, uh, Rabbi, it's uh, great to welcome back Stephen Burke. He's a professor, uh, the Henry, and, what was it, Henry and Sally Schaefer, professor of Holocaust and Jewish Studies, and he's from Union College. And he's like the foremost, the foremost authority on uh, the Holocaust, Middle East, and Eastern European Jewry. So we're going to talk about Eastern European Jewry uh, right now. So in our show, Professor, today. Welcome, thank you for the nice back. words, yes. Professor. Where do we start with Eastern European? I mean, the Roman Empire. It was a few thousand years ago. When, when did the Jews start moving into Jews, Germany? Jews moved into certain parts of the eastern part of the continent really early on. Uh, there is, for example, and I've shown people in Budapest, there is in, in one of the Hiltons on the Buddhist side, you go down, they don't like you to go down there, but you can see tombstones uh, with Hebrew writing on them, probably from the second and third centuries. Oh, really? So wow. Jews, Jews travel. They travel now, and they travel then. And they went to the, uh, the frontiers, the borders of the, of the Roman Empire. So Jews settled there early on. We think that nearly all of them, if not all of them, disappeared for one of a number of reasons. Uh, the Jewish migration, of course, is going to begin uh, probably around the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries, although there is a debate relating to that very interesting group known as the Khazars, not the Cossacks, but the Khazars, K-H-A-Z-A-R-S. And there is some thought this is a group that converted, again, a matter of debate. Did many convert, a few convert to Judaism? This is a Central Asiatic group. Did they convert? Were they forced to the West? Did they migrate to the West? Did they settle in these areas? That's a matter of debate for historians. But fleeing anti-Jewish sentiment, riots, the Crusades, uh, the expulsion from Spain and things like that, Jews move into Eastern Europe and they will multiply very, very rapidly. Hmm. So by the time one gets to the 18th and 19th century, we are talking about millions of Jews living in Eastern Europe. Uh, historians debate as to why there were so many Jews living in Eastern Europe. <sighs> Some of it has to do with Again, a matter of debate here. We don't know exactly. The early marriage. It was not uncommon for a Jewish girl to be engaged at 12 or 13, marriage consummated at 14 to a boy no, no older than 18. And of course, this means that the childbearing years are going to be great, uh, longer, in fact, so more children. In addition to that, the, the premium, be fruitful and multiply, says the Torah. And so the more children you have, the better off the better it is. And then Jews were not thrown into the meat grinder. And that's very important. Up until the French Revolution, no government really would recruit or conscript Jews into military service. The prevailing belief is that the Jews were cowards or they could be of greater service to the country by paying higher taxes. And Jews, therefore, are not going to be thrown into this this system of war after war after war. So that will mean, taken all together, it means that the Jews are going to increase very, very rapidly. They went into Poland because it's hard to say, you know, it's difficult to say that they were more liberal. I mean, you don't think I, of You wouldn't Poland use that term liberal. more liberal, but the fact of the matter is you're on the right track. And that is, despite what we now know about Polish anti-Semitism in the 19th and 20th centuries, in the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, and 17th centuries as well, Poland was a good place for the Jews. It was Spain that wasn't a good place. Spain was not a good place. Right. The Rhineland during the Crusades, England, there would be expulsion after expulsion, and actually a number of Polish kings would actually invite Jews to settle in there. This is not to, one ought not to romanticize this as some Poles do. I mean, there were times when Jews were attacked, but there's no St. Bartholomew's Day in Poland. On St. Bartholomew's Day, a day in August, uh, in the 16th century, French Catholics killed every French Protestant that they could get their hands on. Nothing like that ever happened in Poland. And so the Jews do fairly well. And in Poland and Lithuania and in parts of the Ukraine, 
the Jews will constitute a community or a state within a state. They will be given autonomy, uh, they will have their own representative forms of government, and, and so on. So life was quite good there. Uh, things begin to get more difficult with the coming of, let's say, economic progress, industrialization, nationalism, all of these things are going to work against the Jews. The Jews will be competitors. Well, why is that? Jews will be competitors. So, for example, take a city like what in Polish is called Łódź. In English we say Łódź. This was the Polish Manchester. This was a great uh, textile capital. And it's Jews competing with virtually everybody, with German industrialists, Polish industrialists. This is against the background of endemic poverty. Mm -hmm. It's Jewish lawyers against Polish lawyers, Jewish doctors against Polish doctors, Jewish shopkeepers and stall owners against Poles, and the same thing operating within Russia and Lithuania, and so on. And then there were other things. In the Ukraine, for example, beginning probably in the 17th century, if you were a Pol the Poles dominate most of the Ukraine in the 17th century. If you're a Polish landowner, do you want to be out in the boonies in the Ukraine, or would you rather be in Warsaw or Vilna? And the answer is you probably want to be in Warsaw or Vilna. More urban areas. More urban yeah. areas, at least during the winter. So what do you do? What you do is what very often took place. You went to the wealthiest man that you could find, usually a Jew, a moneylender, or a man who, uh, let me say to you, alcohol and Jews is as Jewish as kreplach and chicken soup. <laughs> right. The Jews don't make the alcohol, but they sell it on the retail level. And they buy it. And they buy it. <laughs> some of them buy it. So right. the point here is some Jews had accumulated some great wealth. And so the landowner says to the Jew, the wealthy Jew, I got to get out of here. My wife says, we got to go to Warsaw. So here's the deal, Jew. Here's the deal. You give me 50,000 zloty. You give it to me up front. And here's what I'll give you. You can tax the peasants. Up to kazoo. Take as much money from the law. I own rivers, the landowner says to the Jew. You can charge the peasants for fishing in the rivers, in the lakes. I own mills. You charge the peasants for milling their grain. You don't have to be a Sigmund Freud to figure out this is not going to endear the Jews to the local population. Right. So that's going to work against the Jews. And then the belief of nationalism. Who are Poles? The argument is going Poles and Catholics. Poles, to be a Pole is to be a Catholic. If you don't have to be a wizard of logic, if you're not a Catholic, you're not a Pole. The Jews are not Catholics. They're going to find themselves in a difficult position. Then some of the things that we have talked about in the other programs, the alleged linkage of Jews with communism in a largely Catholic state, all of these things are going to generate a good deal of animosity towards the Jews. But mind you, the Jewish population will grow and grow and grow, and, and it will become more secularized and more acculturated. Now, the boundaries that we're talking about are not the same today as they were back then where we're talking. No. The Before 1918, from 1795 to 1918, there is no Poland. Poland had been, been partitioned three times in the 18th century, 1772, 1793, and 1795, by Russia and Prussia and the Habsburg Empire. So there's no Poland. Right. But there are, there are Poles, lots of Poles, with a profound sense of national consciousness. And they created a country after the, in the after 1800s. World War One. No, actually, okay. Poland, Pilsudski declares an independent Poland on November 11, 1918, okay. the same day that the war, World War One, comes to an end. But by this time, there's competition, and all these things that we spoke about. There's competition, the linkage of Polishness with Catholicism, uh, the alleged linkage of Jews with communism. All of these things mm -hmm. are going to generate an anti-Semitism an anti in Poland. The same thing is going to operate to a greater or lesser extent in Lithuania and in, other, in Hungary and other places. You know what's well. interesting is that when I try to look at my family history, I found out that the Mormons underneath the, tavern, in the, underneath the tabernacle, they have like all these yeah. records of Eastern European Jews, birth records, death records, 
you know, you can certainly do a lot. Now it's all digitized, I'm told, and you can go right. online. You can and, get a lot of, and you know, if you're interested in genealogy, City, you go to the Mormons. That's you know, absolutely right. Yeah, and, and I thought that was fascinating because the, who would have thought? Who would have thunk it? You know, it's like. <laughs> Except for the fact that it got sticky because uh, it was argued that the Mormons are posthumously converting our ancestors to Mormonism. Right. I personally couldn't care less. I, 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 that doesn't bother me. But you right. talk to older Jews, I guess maybe they're passing away. I mean, we're in the 21st century, but when I was a child, they didn't know if they're Polish and Russian. You know, they didn't, right. I guess that was it the It all depends on it. where they lived, and it depends on the time. Right. So, for example... All these boundaries uh, change. The, the boundaries, boundaries are always changing. Uh, if you're born in Warsaw, if you're in Warsaw before 1918, you are... A citizen of the you're a Russian. You're living within the Russian Empire. You come back after 1918. Warsaw is the capital of Poland. If you are in a place where some of my people come from, Which a is? forsaken place of the world called Bukovina, okay. uh, at times it's part of the Russian Empire. Then it's part of an independent Poland. And today, I believe most of Bukovina is in Romania. So these boundaries are changing all the time. The only positive benefit for that was that the Jewish people became multilingual in order to survive. Uh, Yiddish, of course, was the Mamalushan. They also, nearly all of them in that part of the world spoke Yiddish before World War I. Uh, but they would also speak the, country, the languages of uh, the people amongst whom they were living. So right. for example, in an area where some of my other relatives come from, and where some of your relatives may come from, Galicia. Now, Galicia was part of the Habsburg Empire. That was Austrian Poland. In Galicia, the dominant nationality or ethnic group were the Ukrainians. Next in line were the Poles. And about 20% of the population of Galicia before World War I was Jewish. Hmm. So depending on where you were in Galicia, you spoke, again, Yiddish. If you had some yeshiva training or some other training, you might speak Hebrew, but you also spoke Polish. It might be Polish, both Polish and Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. No, my grandparents were Romanian. They were, my grandmother was born in Moscow and Russia, and other, you know, my grandmother on my mother's side was born in Poland. I mean, it was just the, uh, you know, it was just a, a conglomerate. But, you know, it's interesting because when I went back, I saw, I knew about Bosnia Herzegovina before it was named Bos for the second time Bosnia Herzegovina. You right. know, it was the, it was that name. I mean, changed to Yugoslavia and then back again to the original right. name. Right, Yugoslavia. Yeah. Literally, Yugoslavia means the land of the South Slavs. Right. So that's going to be Slovenians and Croatians mm -hmm. and Serbs. Right. Uh, and Bosnians. The problem in Yugoslavia is they all hate each other. <laughs> and that's, once Tito, Tito kept the lid on it. Mm -hmm. But once he was gone, he was right. heck broke. But gone. Ukraine was the real major part of the Pale of the Settlement. Why don't you explain the, the, the what Pale the of, right, Pale the, of Settlement The Pale was. of Settlement was established in the 1780s when Russia acquired uh, the major part of Poland, which at that time also included parts of the Ukraine. So the Russian government had prided itself for centuries on being the only true Christian government in the world. One, because it was Orthodox, not Catholic, not Protestant. And two, because it prided itself, we're the only country that doesn't allow Jews to live legally in our country, which was true. There were Jews lived there, but they lived illegally. Now, because of the partitions of Poland, Russia now acquires the largest Jewish population in the world, over 500,000 Jews. And the question, this is in the time of Catherine the Great, in the last quarter, last 30 years of the 18th century. What do we do with all these Jews? Now to show you, if you think that we in the, in the 20th and 21st century are civilized and these people are barbarians, when you have a minority in the 20th century and 21st century that you don't like, you know what you do with them? You kill them and you expel them. That never dawned upon these people, even those who hated the Jews. The question was, we've got all these Jews. Should we keep them penned up where they are? Or should we allow them to go wherever they want in this vast Russian empire? 
The conservative element said, these people killed Jesus. They are despicable people. They will cheat the peasants, keep them where they are. The more liberal elements, if that's the correct word here, among the nobility, argued no. The Jews are a prosperous, an industrious, hardworking people. They will act as a leavening influence. Let them live wherever they want. The compromise position was the Pale of Settlement. That's P-A-L-E, sort of from an old French word, a border. Will allow the Jews to move out of where they have been living and allow them to live in certain parts, but not all parts of the Russian Empire. That was the Pale of Settlement. It included most of the Ukraine, but not all of the Ukraine. A good part of Belarus, but not all of Belarus. Lithuania. These, this, was, this was really the pale, the traditional pale of settlement. Uh, the only reliable census in the Imperial Russian period is the census of 1897. And at that time, about 95% of all Jews lived in the pale of settlement. Of Jews of Russia? These are, this, is, this is the Russia. Pale of Settlement is a Russian phenomenon. It's a Russian institution. And they lived there, not into the interior. Some did. Some were allowed to live. So, for example, Siberia, because the Russian government wanted to populate, populate Siberia. Jews were allowed to live in Siberia. Odessa, which was a port city. The Russians wanted to become prosperous. They allowed Jews in larger numbers to move. And in the 19th century, uh, Jews who were wealthy and paid the highest amount of taxes, they also were allowed to settle in the capital cities of Moscow and St. Petersburg. So but again, yeah. by the end of the 19th century, 95% of Jews live in the Pale of Settlement. But there was a problem with the Nazis because that's the closest part to the that, German That's Poland. the tragedy during the Second World War. The Nazis, those panzer divisions, race across Russia. It was tailor-made. Russia is tailor-made for mechanized warfare. Really? Why is that? It's flat. It's flat. Interesting. You don't get any mountains in Russia till you get to the Caucasus, and then you get to the Urals. And the Ural Mountains are not very large. And, and the Carpathians? The Carpathians, they're not in Russia. They're the Carpathians not. are not in Russia. Okay. That's in Poland and, and in certain Romania, other parts. Yeah, Romania, the Carpathians, okay. that's Sorry. something else. Okay. But no rivers, impassable rivers. The Germans are advanced 30, 40, 50 miles a day. And you're quite right. That's the Jewish heartland. Although, because of Soviet rule, this, uh, again, the provisional government comes to power after the Tsar is overthrown. With one stroke of the pen, the provisional government eliminates all the discriminatory legislation against Jews and all other minorities. So Jews, and then the Soviets encourage this, the Jews begin to move into Moscow and St. Petersburg and to other places, but still, we are talking about a good two and a half million Jews, if not more, right smack in front of the advancing German forces, and it is a catastrophe. It's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, you have to know the history to understand what exactly right. really what happened. Even now, in the, the history. The, 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 the two. The, uh, there are many things to talk about. Just I'll juxtapose two things. One is Poland in the interwar period. The most famous saying about Poland, as far as Jews is con was concerned, is that Poland was a bad place for Jews, but a good place for Judaism. And that's an interesting statement. Yeah. yeah, I never heard that. A bad place for Jews in the sense there were some pogroms in Poland. There was discrimination in a whole variety of ways. Uh, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in Poland. But there were no restrictions placed upon Jewish, religious, or cultural life. No, sure. There were Jewish political parties. There were Jewish newspapers. Uh, there were two Yiddish newspapers that probably were read by two million Jews each day, Heint and Moment. So, and there were Jewish, Jewish theater. Right. In, but no, Jewish, again, Jewish political parties. No restrictions whatsoever on Jewish political life or Jewish cultural life. But the anti-Semitism in terms of quotas in the universities, a numerous clauses means a quota. So they restricted the number of Jews in the universities in the late 20s, beginning in the late 20s and the 30s. But in some universities, it was a numerous nullus, no Jews whatsoever. Hmm. But one of the great Hasidic dynasties is the, the Ger Hasidim, led by the Alter family, Rabbi Alter. 
No restrictions on their life whatsoever. And what about the Chabad, Rabbi? Sorry. Well, that's really pretty much in Russia. You're not talking that's in Lithuania. Belarus. That's Lithuania. Chabad is born in Lithuania and Belarus. Okay. Uh, there, the, the Chabad people have their hands full with the communists. I yeah. mean, that's just... The communists took over. That's where all these stories... Right, the communists yes. take over, and it's bad for all religion. Now, the Jews are not singled out mm -hmm. by the communists in the 20s and the 30s. It's a war on the Jewish street. And unfortunately, I must tell you, here are the two, the two, two sides of the coin. Sometimes the most vicious anti-Jewish elements were Jewish communists. <laughs> there was a Jewish section of the Communist Party called the Yevsekzia, the Yevleskia Sekzia, the Jewish section of the Communist Party. Uh, here's a story. One of the people, of a, a woman, Jewish communist in the Yevsekzia, is assigned the task of turning a synagogue into a community center. Not a Jewish community center, but a community center. So she hires a group of Ukrainian workmen, and they, they destroy. They destroy the synagogue. The Jews who are members of the synagogue, they're crying, and they shrine the vault, and so on. She doesn't pay attention to them. Then she says, go up there. Destroy that stuff up there. And the Ukrainians ask her, what is that stuff on top, you know, there? And she's, and the Jews cry, it's the Ten Commandments. And the Ukrainians, the Ukrainian workmen said, we can't destroy it. That's holy to us too. At which point, the woman, the Jewish communist, takes a hammer, smashes the Ten Commandments into the ground, and sends you, says, you fools, that a bolt of lightning come and strike me. So it's a war on the Jewish street against religion and Zionism. But the other side of that coin is that everything was open to the Jews. Wow. There were Jewish submarine commanders, mm -hmm. Jewish generals. Right. The Soviet, the, the, a tacit unwritten agreement was there between the Jews of the Soviet Union in the 20s and 30s and the Soviet government. And Divorce yeah. yourself from the religion. Yeah. Forget about going to the ancient homeland. Attach yourself to the Communist Party. And you'll be fine. And everything is open. Yeah. Everything is open. I wanted to ask you about the migration from Eastern Europe to the United States because at the end of the 19th century, you know, that's when everyone, at least in the Albany area, I know that right. it was in the more urban areas like New York City, it was the 1600s, but it was more of the 1800s. No. The local. turning point is the years 1881, 1882. Mm -hmm. Those are the years of pogroms in Russia. Now, by 20th century standards, they're not great, but hundreds of Jews are killed, many Jewish women are raped, and lots of Jewish property is destroyed. And the question in the aftermath of the pogroms is, in Russian, kuda. Where are we going? Do we stay here? Do we go to America? Or do we go to Palestine? In fact, there's a very famous editorial or article in a Jewish newspaper, one of the Jewish newspapers in Russia. America ili Palestina. America or Palestine. Mm -hmm. Russian Jewish intellectuals Many of them, probably most of them, said, go to Palestine. But 1,500,000 Russian Jews will vote with their feet for the United States. So it begins in 1881. From about 1830 to 1880, mm -hmm. probably 40,000 Jews from the Russian Empire came to our country. 40,000 in a 50 and, period. And it's interesting to note that in the, that time period, Three Orthodox synagogues started in downtown. Oh, that's downtown from German Jews. Albany. Those are German Jews. Not Russian. And then it was every 20 years there was another right. synagogue. Right. So it was a, a Russian influx, then a German influx, and then right. another. Right. I'm trying thing. to tell you. Yeah. From 1830 to 1880, 40,000 Jews from the Russian Empire come to our country. From 1881 to 1914, it's 1,500,000. That's the great influx. They come for a variety of reasons. Historians debate this. Most historians would say they come because they are dirt poor. It's the it's a, contrary to what the anti-Semites have argued, the overwhelming majority of Jews in Eastern Europe were dirt poor. They led a marginal economic existence, and they come because of that. Mm -hmm. But the anti-Semitism <clears throat> also plays a role, and so too does the ultimate nightmare of many Jewish parents, and that is conscription into the Russian army. Right. So these are the things that lead uh, Jews to come here. Emigration and immigration is always a function of push and pull. Something pushes you out, and something pulls you in. Have you ever and let me just say to you, for many Jews living in Eastern Europe, 
the United States is the golden of Medina. Mm -hmm. It's the golden land where everything is possible. Streets are paved with gold. Some people should <laughs> say the streets are paved with gold. Or as one German Jew will write to his relatives in, Ger in the German lands. There's no Germany until 1871. So uh, he writes, here I don't have to kneel before anyone. I don't have to kneel before the nobleman. I'm just like everybody else here. So the letters come back, and by the end of the 19th century, there are technological changes. The railroads, you don't have to walk anymore. The railroads will bring you to the ports. The steamships will bring you in a week to this country. You don't have to, and they're cheap. The steamship lines are competing with each other, and they're lying through their teeth. Mm -hmm. One steamship company actually publishes a, a brochure in Yiddish saying that there is an article in the American Constitution that says if people of one ethnic group or one religious group can become a majority in one of the American territories, they can have a state of their own. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. nonsense. But all of these things play a role in this massive emigration. And the emigration, of course, not only goes to the United States, most of it comes to the United States, but tens upon tens of thousands of people will go from Eastern Europe to Germany, swelling the German Jewish population. Uh, they will go to France, settling in Paris, particularly in Paris. Mm -hmm. They'll go to Australia, but uh, they will go primarily to Argentina. That is outside of the United States and Europe. And you know, after World War II, there were some of the Jews that fled to China. They went west and not... All right, there was... Uh, there was a Rabbi uh, Jewish Rubin community in Shanghai. Rubin. Actually, there's a Jewish community in Harbin. Uh, and then there was, the Japanese took over Manchuria in the 1930s. Most Jews who were living in Harbin fled to Shanghai. Shanghai was an open port. You didn't need a visa, you didn't need a passport. You got off the ship, yeah. that was it. Yeah. Uh, and there were, by the time the German and Austrian Jews come in the second half of the 1930s, there were already in existence a fairly, certainly a very wealthy and fairly numerous uh, Sephardic community, uh, and communities from India, Jewish Jews had come from, from India. The great Shanghai Jewish families had started out, first they started out, actually some of them came from Iran, some of them came from Baghdad. They come from Baghdad to Bombay, and the more venturesome of them, venturesome of them go from Bombay to Shanghai. And Rabbi Rubin, who's the head of the Chabad, uh, his family went that route. From your right, now that raises an interesting <laughs> thing. So the Japanese attitude, the Japanese dominate Shanghai. They are hell on wheels towards the Chinese. I mean, the slogan is, take all, kill all, rape all, loot all, and everything like that. They kill at least 20 million Chinese. But when it came to the Jews, it's very interesting. Their attitude was, the Jews are a special people. They're very smart, they're very wealthy, they're very well connected maybe we ought to have good relations with them. And therefore, the Japanese will not do to the Jews what the Germans were always telling the Japanese to do to the Jews. Kill them or send them over to us. The Japanese will not do that. Hmm. I mean, sometimes they will be harsh. Right. Eventually, during the war, uh, they will establish a ghetto in Shanghai, but it was not a ghetto in the German sense of the word. Again, just to take everything to the current events, it's even, well, Koreans, which I know are a different people than Japanese and Chinese, but the Oriental mind is really Israel when they deal with Israel. Again, that same attitude, hey, they're prosperous, they're looking at objective. Hey, why are they from all odds, against all odds? They're prosperous and they're intelligent and Nobel Prize winners. They say, hey, these are somebody we ought to yeah, connect that's, with. Some people do. The flip side of that is that some people draw a different conclusion. They're too powerful and, and, and will draw the, the, the conventional anti-Semitic conclusion. But you are absolutely right. The Asian attitude, uh, again, the Japanese attitude on the part of some Japanese. Some Japanese are virulently hostile towards Jews. But others, very sympathetic to Jews and to Israel. Now, on the YouTube, there was this... <laughs> this very interesting uh, protest in Japan of Japanese, some of whom speaking an absolutely impeccable Hebrew, supporting the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. That's interesting to hear Japanese speaking in impeccable, uh, impeccable Hebrew. Impeccable <laughs> Hebrew. <laughs> you know, Professor, again, we're out of time. It's always such a pleasure listening to you. I could listen all day and all year. 
to all your lectures, I should sign up for Union College and we get myself another or college. Or sign up for Agud uh, yeah. when he Rabbi, has lecture Mark, anytime you want to come into class, it's all right with me. And in fact, you can tell your viewers. Okay. Anytime they want to come into class, just give me a call beforehand and I will allow them to sit in in the classes. Oh, excellent. excellent. Thank, Thank you, you Professor. Very much. Keep on your excellent work. People need this knowledge. It's very important for not only Jewish people, but for everybody. And keep on going with good health. Thank, Thank you very much.